Okay, uh, this is Jim Kenny. Uh, welcome. Oh, are you going to do it, David? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Welcome to Analyze Your Trade, episode number sixty-five for uh, February twelfth, two thousand nineteen. Today we will be discussing your trade ideas and. Over the past few days, about 30 people submitted up to five symbols each, and I've put the list together of the top requests, which you should be seeing on your screen right now while I'm talking. Uh, we are broadcasting live on YouTube at 4.30 p.m. Eastern Time, but you can also listen to the audio-only version of all, uh, of all the episodes on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, Podbean, or wherever else you listen to podcasts. Uh, just search for Timing Research and subscribe. My name is David Cosmeter. I'm the creator of timingresearch.com, and I have Jim Kenny here to moderate today. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to him. Okay, thank you very much, David, and welcome, everybody. Uh, today we have, with us, we have uh, Neil Batho of uh, TraderReview.net and George uh, Papazov of uh, Trading, uh, excuse me, Trade Pro Academy. Uh, we're going to go over uh, as many stocks as we can that are on the list here, and uh, what we're going to start out with is an uh, introduction. So if, uh, Neil, you want to start out and introduce yourself on who you are and what you do. And Neil, you're muted. Yeah, okay. Um, I run uh, TraderReview.com, and uh, I was a broker back in 98, 99, and then I did some consulting for a few years, and then I got into uh, into uh, sending out my analysis to clients. And I uh, used point and figure, which I learned when I was a broker right before I left, which I'm really glad I did. Uh, did a seminar back then before webinars even existed. And uh, I've been using the technology ever since. And then I also implemented the Ichimoku Cloud as well for fine tuning. And I send out the best stock and option picks to my clients. Great. And uh, Neil's going to give us a lot of insight on what he sees on the stocks that you guys sent in. So make sure you take notes and, uh, and see what he's got to say. Uh, next up is uh, George uh, Papazov of Trade Pro Academy. George, uh, you want to fill in on uh, what you do and, and who you are? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me on the show, guys. Um, as, as you mentioned, my name is George Papazov. I'm, I'm over here at Trade Pro Academy. Uh, we're a team of uh, six people here. We have a couple of traders with us, um, a few support reps as well, customer success management side. But what we do essentially at Trade Pro Academy, uh, hang on, squawk is in my ear, trade the news. Uh, what we do at Trade Pro Academy is we, we do a lot of training around order flow and we operate a daily live trading room where we apply order flow analytics to trading futures for high probability low risk trade setups. We trade together as a team. It's a very team-based environment. Uh, and then on the other side of the business as well, we also do swing trading using options strategy. We focus a lot on technicals. So my perspective here throughout the podcast, so we give you some technical analysis levels and ideas as we go along. Um, so we do a little bit swing trading and then a lot of day trading as well. Uh, we offer both sides of that. We have newsletters, many other services as well, but above all else, we're a community of traders that stick together, trade together, laugh and some days cry together <laughs> although not many <laughs> that sounds great okay i'm jim kenny i am the uh, content provider for optionprofessor.com and i've been doing seminars and webinars for decades i've educated people uh, thousands of people at hundreds of seminars throughout the country and basically what we try to do is educate people on the uses and risks of option trading using it for both hedging purposes like the collar strategy obviously prior to the december uh, crash uh, there were some overbought indicators. Had you used some hedging tactics up there, it would have offset a lot of risk. And also uh, how to uh, uh, replace uh, stock positions with limited risk options, like when the market is way down in December, rather than panicking out of all your stocks, maybe replacing them with leaps. So at least you have limited risk and don't run away from the market at the bottom. So there's a lot of uses in, uh, that you can use these options for. And at optionprofessor.com for decades, we've been trying to explain uh, how they work so you could take advantage of them. Okay, today we've got a lot of different stocks, so let's jump right in. Uh, we're going to keep the same order uh, with Neil, George, and myself. So let's hit it first with uh, Square. What do you got there, Neil? Sorry, I missed that. Am I up now? Yeah, Neil, I uh, just said uh, Square. Uh, we're starting out with Square, and you're going to go first, followed by George, and then myself. Okay, so I think I'm screen sharing. Is the chart already up there for Square? I have. Yeah. What? Yeah, we can see it. Okay, great. So this is just the Ichimoku Cloud. Uh, it's support and resistance, 
and uh, it'll take the volatility and push it forward to make a cloud-like trend lines. And so what I'm looking at here is basically when something rebounds, what I've noticed over the last I mean, many, many years is you get a lot bigger rebound than you think. So I think that we can actually get up around to the 98 area here on Square, and then I'd be looking to get out. But I think it could be great for a trade. And if the market's up tomorrow and you get just the teeniest little breakout, 70. Six seven, I think it's a good buy. Okay, um, George, how are you looking at Square right now? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, great question. Square is coming up to some earnings coming out on February twenty seventh. Uh, pre earnings in terms of options trading for us, we tend to stay away from it due to the volatility crush. But uh, all in all, I think it's a great payment platform. Um, it's had a bit of a retracement down to these fifties. I think we could clear this eighty level and above on square all uh, signals are go for a rally a lot of these stocks will, will depend on the overall market condition as well a lot of this news coming out of the government today with the new shutdown the china trade war as well by the end of february march first deadline a lot of developments will kind of affect all these stocks at the same time so as i'm going through this analysis something to keep in mind is that uh, one may outperform temporarily but they're they're tied together there's a lot of intermarket correlation so above 80 i'm seeing a green light for it seeing some volume come back in but it's pre-earnings so I'd love to see what happens um, after earnings on a four-hour chart. I like the uh, support structure at 73, even on a naked point of control. Should we be should we be screen sharing as well? I think that's probably yeah, helpful. If you'd like, yeah. Okay, perfect. I'll do that next time around for the next sure. time. All right. Well, let me give you a quick uh, review on I IC Square. Obviously, it, it dumped, uh, lost half of its value <clears throat> during the drop in December. That's uh, nothing to sneeze at. 100 going down to 50. Now we bounce back up to 75 and we have uh, surpassed the averages, the 50 day and the 200 day, but they're still inverted to the downside. Uh, some of this buying may very well have come from short covering because we have 9.26% of the stock short, which is a pretty high number. The volume today was nothing to write home about uh, as far as I could see. It looked like it was a little bit on light volume. Again, like George was saying, if the entire market's going up to 28 or 2900, I'm sure Square will participate. And there are some Elliott Wave guys who think that if we got above 2725 today, it was very constructive to go towards 28 or 29 in the short run. Only time will tell. My feeling is, is again, it's had a very big run off the low and it is a situation where it has uh, uh, exceeded the moving averages, which is definitely a positive, but we have to see if it's going to be sticky or not up here. And again, a lot will determine whether this move up above 2725 is a sig uh, is a signal uh, that we have another wave that we're involved in, taking us to 28 or 2900, or if this is just basically something that is going to fizzle out towards the end of the week. We'll have to see how that goes. But uh, right now, obviously, it looks very good. Next one uh, is going to be EWZ which I think is uh, Brazil, is it not? And Neil, what are you seeing in... Um, Neil just, uh, he just cut, got cut off, I think. So uh, okay. let's go to George. Sure. Okay, yeah. well, George, you know, these are the iShares for Brazil. They just elected a new guy. Uh, people had been plowing into this thing because of uh, obviously the changes that are supposed to happen. How do you see it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, who's the president? in brazil right now we can't even agree on that so there's clearly there's some uh, turmoil out of brazil i think one of the the most the, the sexiest trades kind of in the last few months has been the long emerging markets trade you'll, you'll hear just about everyone going nuts over it uh i do see it a little bit overextended at this time there's some resistance structure at 47 moving averages are are starting to move to the upside volumes though uh, in this last move down to 42 started to pick up on the bearish side of momentum's diverging so I think a good opportunity here would be that if you're already long, uh, take a little bit of profit and move stops up. But another entry structure would be in the middle of the 39, like somewhere around the 39 level. Um, I think that just too much money piled onto this trade at the very same time, and we're seeing it stall out as a result. And I think we have to take some sell stops out first. But around 42 is your first real good opportunity with a stop somewhere below 41 would be uh, worth a shot on some on some pullback. It's just, there's a lot of political madness going on. And, you know, I'm not privy to some of that info until it hits the news, as most of us aren't. And so I would expect more volatility out of this. And because of that, I'd probably be keeping the position um, a little bit smaller than usual. I love to reduce positions in, in volatile conditions 
and scale into positions rather than go all in. That's just kind of an outlook on the ETF. I think it's, it's really hinging a lot on the political situation. Very resource rich country. Uh, but I just think we've gotten a little ahead of ourselves in this uptrend. Yeah, uh, the um, EM emerging market trade uh, has seen more cash running into that this year than it's seen in many, many years. So it is a situation where um, it could be a little bit on the short run, a little overdone. 45 definitely looks like a number that uh, is causing some trouble up here. So getting above 45, excuse me, 45, uh, getting above 45 would be very constructive. The moving averages are uh, inverted to the upside. So that's a good thing. 41 on the 50 day and 37 and change on the 200 day. So if you're long this thing and you want it to have lines in the sand, looks like the 40 number and the 37 number aren't too bad as far as, um, you know, where you'd want it to hold if it did pull back. You know, uh, talk is cheap. And uh, obviously, a lot of the bidding up that we've seen uh, since the uh, end of last year is uh, about uh, the new guy coming in. And now, of course, he's got to take all this talk and turn it into policy action. And that may be easier said than done. So the massive amount of money running into um, uh, EM, the uh, big move that it's had from the uh, 30 area up to 45, and the fact that it seems stalled up here, you know, might be something to be concerned about. But if you are long, it looks like a thing that makes reasonable sense to be long. But 41 and 37 would be exits that I'd be looking at if it started to come down. Uh, Neil, are you back? Or is that uh, George? He He's not. Neil's not okay. back yet. But that's okay. Me. I like the that's short that's short run and overdone phrase. Uh, Jim, that's yeah. awesome. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, uh, we're good with, uh, we're good with uh, the Brazilian ETF. And now we're going to uh, keep moving down and we're going to hit uh, AMD. And AMD is a very popular stock with a lot of pickers here. So let's see what you think about that, George. Yeah, absolutely. I guess it's you and I, just uh, rapid fire. Love it. Sure, um, sure. AMD just had earnings uh, on the 29th of January. So I'm screen sharing. I'm hoping you could you could see this now. Um, it, it had some earnings coming out, and it looks like they missed. And despite the miss, we saw a little bit of a rally. We, we have an earnings gap here somewhere around 21. And uh, if you could see – can you guys see the screen? I just want to double check before. Yeah. Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. Okay, good. Great, thanks guys. Um, so what we're looking here for AMD is a pullback, maybe to these 21 structures. We see a little volume profile building out and uh, the, the moving averages are sideways, lacking a little bit of indecisions, more consolidation bound. And you can see this co consolidation taking place. But my only issue is that on the down moves, we're seeing a lot more volume come out than on the up move. This entire rally took place on very low, thin and declining volume. Uh, as, as far as levels go, I always like to go on a one or four hour chart depending on the, the freak or the length of the position I'm anticipating. And I look for naked points of control. Uh, you could keep your clothes on. Naked means that it's just a level where the most amount of volume traded, but it hasn't hit that level yet. So we haven't traded through the most amount of volume of these sessions. And I like to look for these levels for areas of contention and support. So just looking at that point of control around the 21, and when you sum it up with the fact that there's a lot of volume profile here, a lot of institutional buying, right after earnings and an earnings gap, I think around 21 would be a decent long. Um, and again, it just looks like there's a lack of, of momentum or a trend here other than the earnings. So I'd be neutral to slightly bullish on around 21. Yeah, it does seem like it is uh, trying to turn up. Uh, the um, semiconductor index, SMH, uh, has had a pretty good size move from 80 back up to 100. So obviously, the people are definitely plowing back into the uh, semis. And uh, basically, they did get hit quite a bit. So um, again, uh, short interest is probably pretty high in a lot of stocks. In this stock, AMD, I got short interest at almost 12% of the stock. That's a high number. So that means these people, wow. as it turns up, are, are going to be covering their shorts. And if after they cover their shorts, there's nobody behind them to buy. Sometimes it's hard for the thing to keep going. Moving averages don't look too bad. Uh, 20 and a half and 20 are the 50 and the 200 day ballpark figures. Uh, so, you know, from that standpoint, if you were long the stock, you certainly uh, have an area to put a stop right under 20, I guess, and see if it'll keep going for you. Um, the uh, P ratio that I'm seeing is 71, but I guess these things trade rich all the time, but certainly 71 doesn't sound like a cheap stock. But uh, again, uh, it is uh, the whole uh, sector 
has been having a big, strong bid with this big, strong advance we've seen in the last month. So obviously, uh, this is one of the ones that people are getting into. But uh, right now, it does look a little stalled out. But uh, if the earnings do come out and uh, and support it, uh, it could keep going because, again, we do have inverted uh, uh, moving averages to the upside. All right. Uh, let's keep moving on here. Uh, the next one is Starbucks. Uh, their former head wants to be president. Uh, what do you want to do with that stock, George? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, I didn't realize 12% was the short interest on in AMD. That's interesting because one of our guys here in the office just mentioned he's fading rallies on this and selling to the downside. So uh, interesting stuff. Thanks for that stat. Really powerful. Um, on to Starbucks, Jim. I'm, I'm looking at Starbucks. I love the company. Honestly, I've loved Starbucks for a long time. Um, I love that they're they're kind of venturing into serving alcohol and I mean other than the fact that you know it's going to be a revenue driver for them but they're getting into a lot of premium uh, espresso bars and coffees they have that um, the black cup with the gold star on it anyways as a company I love Starbucks so I'm a little bit biased towards it because I just love the culture the people the idea behind it um, but it you know looking at it impartially and separating that we just had earnings on Starbucks and we have a new high on it as we trade above the 68, that was the previous high around that range. It's moving higher. Everything's ticking higher on this. The only thing that concerns me is that it tends to be an overbought stock in a market of uncertainty as a whole. We have a lot of uncertainty events. And I think that as goes Starbucks or as goes the S&P 500 in the broad market, will go Starbucks as well. This is a great level to have already been long and, and be taking profit. And so I'd expect to look for a pullback for this for an entry. I uh, would not really like to... I'll be getting into it at this level, but a pullback, what does that look like? Somewhere down into 67. There's a lot of notifications popping up. I try and turn them off. Um, what I do notice is that Starbucks is on a new high, but momentum itself isn't really tracking with it. MACD, RSI, all the momentum indicators um, are tracking lower. Not that an indicator has ever made or break or broken a trade for me, but it just it's a little top heavy and I think we missed the boat on this long. So if I switch to Starbucks and I look at my naked points of control, I think a good level is around the 67 for a long, uh, but as a company, I love it and I'm looking for a long opportunity. And obviously the market needs to keep moving up. I think it overall in the S and P 500, we're a transition point where leading up to where we are today, we had a lot of upside. And if you look at volume, it's been weak. So I think the upside's happening on short covering and there isn't a lot of new institutional money coming in. And with the closure of the government, the COT reports that come out every Friday have been delayed as well. Uh, and we're just getting a peek into what's going on now. But all in all, I guess if I'll sum that up, contingent on a continuation to the upside of the broad market. But I love Starbucks uh, around 68. And until then, I'll be drinking its coffee. Mm -hmm. waiting. Yeah, well, it obviously has had a big run since the middle of last year. It's gone from 50 to 70 for a big company like this. It's an $87 billion company. Uh, to jump up like that is uh, certainly um, impressive. Uh, the one thing that's hitting me right now, and I keep an eye on this quite a bit, is overbought, oversold, because it has been um, a pretty reasonable, uh, meaningful statistic. We're at 58 or so on the 200-day uh, moving average. When you're up at 70, uh, according to my math, we're about 20% above the 200-day um, average. Now, anything 20, 30, 40% above is considered, in my view, rich, and that's where you're susceptible for a pullback. Uh, 65 is the 50-day, so you know, obviously pulling back to 65 would be possible. And then, of course, a more severe correction going down towards 58.60, which is the pullback low during December or January. Uh, that's a big number, too, 58.60. So uh, being it up here, I probably wouldn't be interested in too much buying. If I owned it and I saw it go from 50 to 70, I might even consider a short-term collar where you sell an out-of-the-money call, take the premium in and buy a put and freeze in some of that gain that you had and see how the cards come out in the months of March and uh, and uh, and see how the thing goes. But uh, it looks a little frothy when you're 20% above or more, particularly on a big company like this, unless there's some big announcement with China coming up that's going to blow it off the top. But uh, uh, from what I can see here, it looks a little short-term overbought and uh, it could uh, roll over and have a big, bit of a correction unless, again, a big news report hits it. Jim, okay. Yep. I'm sorry. Can I, can I add one thing? I think that's a great point you brought up about the color strategy. I think because it's gone up so much and it's frothy, kind of like a cappuccino, I think uh, long puts here is a, is a decent opportunity because of the lower implied volatility. And if you're long, I would resist 
uh, selling calls at this lower volatility and maybe just look for the for the put. But but I love the idea um, of of taking yeah, I mean, advantage. You know, of you, you, yeah, definitely. Uh, you price out both the strategies, uh, married put and the collar, and you go with the one that you think makes the most sense. Because Absolutely. again, with the thing very close to fifty-two week highs, you don't know if it's going to have an eighty print. Because if it comes out and says there's a China deal, and part of the China deal is a uh, you know, waiving a lot of um, impediments uh, to companies like uh, Starbucks, you know, it could go crazy on the upside. So you have to be careful Absolutely. of that. But at, at 31 to uh, 31 P ratio, it's not a cheap stock. No, not so, at all. <laughs> yeah. So that's, that's the other thing you got to factor in. Anyway, let's take a look at NVIDIA, which has been a wild ride for people. And um, again, they're in the semi area as well. Let's see how that done. What do you got on NVIDIA, George? Yeah, absolutely. And NVIDIA today. Yeah, big move, uh, really big move. Earnings are coming up on NVIDIA on the 14th of February. So we're, we've seen a lot of the earnings of these companies pass through in the late stage of the, the Q4 earnings season. Earnings have been great for all companies if you look at the lowered analyst expectations, but year over year is where the, the, the chinks in the armor are gonna start to show, if you will, because they've been revising analyst forecasts so low that eventually you're gonna jump over a hurdle. But there, if there is no hurdle and you walk by, have you jumped over a hurdle? So that's kind of the whole earnings season, but uh, we're coming in on NVIDIA into earnings season and the earnings report. And it, to me, I look at NVIDIA and it's it's impossible to look at it like anything but um, a crypto play, <laughs> right? A lot of the, the crypto sector as it went in, uh, the video cards started to explode in price. I had to pay double the money to, to get my six monitor card set up. Uh, but we're looking at some lows here, it's consolidating near these 140s, there's a little bit of a range. You see how much is dropped. And if you actually measure the move from about the 20 area up to the 280, I know that's a wide move from 2016, we're at about the halfway point. Halfway points are really good kickers for support, uh, but we're way below technicals. And I honestly think that as long as we stay below 160, Nvidia is gonna see a little bit more downside. Looks like it's gonna be a short play. Um, to the downsides, consolidating, finding some buyers and accumulating some long area or long positions. And what's underneath a long position, sell stops. And I think that the liquidity right now is building below on NVIDIA. Uh, a level that I would look to maybe sell it or do an options play is around the 160 marker to 170. Anything above there, you're getting into a pretty um, wide gap from the last earnings report. And so that should be pretty solid resistance for a move lower but yeah i gotta i gotta be bearish on it i gotta stay with the technicals getting long here would be risky so if you like it and you want to get long uh smaller size would be my sort of internal um instinct and if you're an investor for the long term for it then then hold it buy more if this company's gonna be around 10 20 years from now and you think they're gonna be a big part of of the uh, technology sector providing their video cards then it's a good long-term opportunity as far as the short term goes i think we see some more downside well, this thing really got slammed, uh, as you can see from any chart you look at. 300 bucks down to 124 is pretty much um, a, a wipeout. Um, surprisingly, the short interest has been not very big on this uh, company, 2.30% according to my screen. But I would say this, uh, that um, it does look like a decent value. The PE ratio, I mean, this company is making money. Uh, the PE ratio is at 20. That seems kind of low for a, from a semiconductor uh, stock. And it is a, a sector that I already said has moved up looking at the S SMH. Also, from an oversold situation, uh, when we got down to 125 area uh, the day after Christmas, we were like 45% um, under the 200-day moving average. Right now, we're still 31% underneath the 200-day average. So like George was saying, if you think this is a company that is going through a short-term problem and this 100 area is going to hold, and you're a longer term holder, you know, I would definitely say that this would be something to investigate from the value side, because, you know, when it was up at 300, I will assure you these PE ratios and these other numbers were not as friendly as they are now. So if you do think this is a viable firm on a long term basis and you do think it's going through short term volatility, this is when you might start taking a bite somewhere between 100 and 150. Um, All righty then. Uh, what do we got on the docket here? The next one, BPMC. What are you seeing on BPMC, George? Yeah, thank you, uh, Jim. BPMC, I've never, I'm going to be transparent here. I've never really heard or uh, ever charted the stock. And so as far as my perspective goes, it's only going to be on technicals. Uh, in terms of the medicine field, 
you know, I, I've got some strong and sometimes controversial beliefs, so I won't impart those upon you. But um, <laughs> in, in terms of the company itself, it looks like it suffered quite a bit of downside from these 108s, it looks like, on the high side. Uh, once again, we have an earnings report coming up on it, so be very cautious over the next couple of days. Earnings are out on the 24th of February. Um, we're towards the top of, of the previous move down, and on the rotation up, we've managed to get above the halfway point, which suggests that the downside may be over and more horizontal structure could form here. We've broken above the 200-day moving average and the 100-day moving average, and I think a pullback to there would be pretty decent around the 68.30. Momentum is just absolutely on fire on this talk, on this uh, stock. So I think temporarily it's overbought, but in the longer term, if we could take out this 80, you've got a lot of upside potential um, on this stock. And uh, you know, you you also have to pair that with some fundamental analysis. If you're a longer term investor, if you're just looking for a trade, then it may not matter what the company actually does, which is what we do. We just ride out some options plays based on price action volume. Um, and I'll give you a level for anyone looking for a long. We have a lot of naked points of controls on the way down, um, you know, which suggests liquidity could could come into there and test these areas. Support level ultimately is around the 68s. And I'm sure that you'll see some buy orders start to stick on here. But is it a, a very heavily traded company? Let's see, what's the average volume? 280, volume. what's that? What are you showing an average for the last like 50 days? Um, or for volume, I'm seeing 300,000. I got a nine day moving right. average applied to my volume at 300,000 right. shares. Right. Um, you know, I, it's hard to get excited about this stock and whoever contributed it, that's no, it's just no way, um, you know, you shouldn't take that as a negative, it's super positive, just study a little bit more. And, and that's my opinion. I think some upside if we get above 80. Yeah, I mean, with biotech, it's always going to be, uh, do they have the next uh, thing that's going to either be uh, approved or do they have something that a bigger company wants to uh, pick up? It's a $3 billion company, so it is uh, not a mom and pop outfit, but it's also not uh, over the top huge if these bigger companies want to, um, and especially if it's a cancer drug, they seem to really want those companies quite a bit. Uh, companies losing money, according to I can see, so uh, it's not a money maker right now. So whatever they've got is a come line bet, meaning that, uh, it's a situation where people are hoping that they'll get approved or somebody might see these guys uh, work as uh, something you want to pick up. Um, right now, again, it's been trading between 50 and one uh, and 75, and it's been kind of in that range ever since it broke down in the middle of last year. Uh, the moving averages don't invert it to the downside, uh, 61 and 67 on the 50 day and the 200 day. Short interest is 6.85%. Not uh, huge, but certainly not small. So there's some short covering going on, I'm sure. Um, but uh, the technicals and the moving averages are not very helpful to me. I don't see a real uptrend here other than I see maybe news that hit that drove it from 50 to 75. And if that news continues, obviously, and they, and they come up with something that can break 75, then you're back on the bicycle again quite a bit so this 75 area looks like resistance and if i was looking at it i'd probably want to see um, uh, see if it'll hold this area or get through the 75 before you know you buy into a rally that has already been 50 percent in the last month uh, this is similar to many companies though because coming out of that drop in december the snapback has been vicious so if you've been short the market or under invested and chasing it uh, you've had a very tough racket in the last six weeks um, again, uh, that's biotech and it's a uh, live by the sword, die by the sword kind of a sector, right? Um, we <laughs> yeah. have got the, we've got the next one called shop S H O P. Yeah, absolutely. I think we need for, uh, for BPMC, Jim, I think we need Martin Shkreli to come out of prison and buy this and increase drug prices 6,000%. And it might get a little bit of a run. Uh, that, that might work. That might work. Yeah. But uh, let's uh, let's uh, gouge the people that are uh, that are sick. That's uh, I always thought that was a great business plan, right? Yeah, People absolutely. are sick and let's try to make as much money on as possible. That's a good well, What move. a move. All right. Anyway, so we got Shopify and we want to know what George thinks of Shopify. I love this company. Honestly, Shopify, in terms of like the business that they're in, uh, if you look at online commerce, it's a business that's just set to thrive. And I, I looked at some numbers recently. Actually, I listened to whoever contributed the symbol, anyone that's interested in, in Shopify. There's an interview with the CEO. Uh, it, and it's a fascinating interview by Tim Ferriss. If you have a look at or listen to this podcast, it's a two hour and 20 minute uh, interview with him. And, and he picks his brain pretty deeply and finds out some awesome info. So Shopify is a company 
the way the business is run, very efficient, very great operation. And they're in a great business space. I could only see more online commerce. Uh, we're seeing that with the sort of not the death of retail, but but the loss of volumes are from retail traffic. So Shopify is a company that benefits on a transactional basis on, on online commerce. I think they're in a great space. Um, you know, the, based on the podcast I heard, I really love the, the leadership and, and their strategy around it. So I like it from that standpoint. Now, in terms of buying it, it looks like they had earnings today, right before the bell, um, down eight cents on their estimate, or it's maybe reporting after the bell. I'm not 100% sure. I'd have to check the wire. Let me just have a quick gander here, kind of running ahead of schedule. They did have negative earnings that I'm seeing, but did the earnings go positive or are they still losing money? Well, that's a good question. I'm just trying to scroll through and and see when they would have. I'd have to go in the morning. Well, anyways, um, you know, the, overall, if you look at it from a technical standpoint, I mean, they're towards a range high at the moment. And it's a pretty steep range, 175 all the way down to 120. So it's a $50 range. The halfway point of that range, and I love halfway points of any range for any stock. The reason being at the top, you're getting longs getting into the position. At the bottom, sellers are capitulating. Where do sellers and longs have their stop losses? Dead smack in the middle. That's the maximum point of pain for both buyers and sellers. And maximum points of pain create good uh, long opportunities, good trading opportunities. So that lands around 150. Um, I love the stock. It looks like the moving averages are starting to go. Momentum's a little bit hot right now, and pullbacks are would be longable here. I, after an earnings report, I let a company settle down for a few days, and um, considering that the gap was lower and now we filled it, we might see some slow trickle selling down to about 155 to 60. And if I pull up the points of control, you can see we put one in around 170, so a more aggressive opportunity would be around the 170. Ideally, if you get it low 160s, I mean, that's exciting. But I like Shopify, um, and I'm really, really, you know, the outlook on it's rosy. The one thing I will mention is that with online commerce, it, it's very uh, contingent on the strength and overall health of the economy. And if we start to see a slowdown in the economic cycle, like we're seeing some of the data coming in the last couple of weeks, uh, you know, this could end up being a pullback that's a lot more severe than the 160. So I'd say long, but with caution. And let it come down. Right now, it's overbought. It's top of a range. Um, I'm not a breakout trader. I think breakout trades are the riskiest. They they have the least amount of opportunity with the most amount of risk. So I'd like to see it coast back down. All right. Um, what I'm seeing here is a company that obviously has tremendous momentum. So if you're a momentum player for the last month, you've been uh, riding a pretty good wave here. Um, Obviously, you know, it's not that far from its 52-week high here. Um, uh, 180 was it, and now it's uh, up today, 175. Uh, today, huge volume. Uh, according to my screen here, it was almost uh, 6 million shares, and it normally trades an average of about a million and a half ballpark figures. So obviously, somebody's plowing in big time now uh, if, those, uh, if those volume figures are accurate, which I'm just reading off the screen here. Um, so again, with that kind of volume, you know, it's hard to step in front of a freight train. And uh, the only reason you might do that is with that kind of volume, don't forget there had to be a seller for every buyer. So somebody did fade almost 6 million shares here today, right? There were sellers for every buyer. And that is a heck of a lot of volume uh, for that company. And it is almost 20% above its 200-day average. So, you know, you're getting into an overbought condition a bit on the moving average. You had the volume blow off, as far as I can see, to the upside. You didn't make a new high above 180. And so, again, this thing either blows through 180 and it's off to the races because something's going on there. Who knows with regards to uh, uh, news or takeovers or whatever. Or um, it's a... Uh, could be, you know, kind of a blow off high here with the volume. <clears throat> so I'd look at that 180 as a very important area because that's the 52 week high. And then I would um, I would uh, be looking to see if it might pull back a little bit because the 148 200 day average is almost 20 percent underneath the current price. So this is probably going to be a pretty wild ride because with the volume here today, somebody made some pretty darn big bets. Uh, the short interest is 7.66 percent, not off the charts huge, but certainly enough to create a bid for the for the uh, for the short coverers. But 180 key number. Uh, volume big. Let's see what happens here in the next uh, couple of days. If this volume dries up and it rolls over, you know, again, a pullback might make a lot of sense. You blow out a 180, something's going on with this company, and obviously you don't want to fight the tape. 
Um, with regards to the next one, Z-U-O. Z-U-O, Zuo, Zuora Inc. That's the company. Um, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll go. I guess it's my turn. Sounds like that's been the pattern. Because if you don't learn a pattern over nine stocks, we're never going to learn it. <laughs> exactly. Um, <laughs> so um, I'm looking at Zuora. Uh, I'm looking at Zuora here, and um, this company doesn't look like it's been around very long. It looks like May of 2018. And, uh, you know, one of the, the criteria for me for trading, and remember, trading and investing are different whole, uh, like the objectives of trading and investing are different. You you could be a great trader, and that helps your investing. Uh, but being a good investor doesn't necessarily help your trading as much. So from a trading perspective, I like to see a stock be around a little bit longer than, than 18 months or so, just so I could get a feel for the movement. And um, I don't know much about this company. It's new. And I'll tell you this. I would probably just glaze it overall together for a trade opportunity just under the condition that putting in a dollar into a new company means that it comes with a lot of unknowns. And I'm going to pay to learn those lessons of what this company is eventually going to do. Whereas I could put that same dollar, my opportunity cost is higher into other positions that have moved for longer with more volume that are more readable. Uh, and more clear on the technicals. From a totally technical perspective, it looks like it's sideways and it's right at the price where it IPO'd uh, and opened up. So we had a wild ride, but we were really kind of back to square one. So, you know, I really don't have anything further that to, uh, to add to this stock. I'm not 100% familiar with it. Yeah, I'm not 100% familiar, but I'm familiar with the companies that come out at 20, jump up to almost 40, and then come right back to 20. <laughs> and the familiarity I have on that is uh, somebody uh, whacked, uh, the people who bought it on the offer, uh, you know, started whacking it pretty hard as soon as it went up. So, um, again, I'm not uh, familiar with the company that much. They are losing money, according to what I see on their EPS. Um and I'm looking at a situation where the volume, I've noticed this on a number of stocks today that uh, outside of Spotify, um, Shopify, I'm sorry, um, that um, the volume seems a little bit lighter than normal during this advance we saw today. Uh, for instance, this company, I'm showing 661,000 shares, ballpark figure, normally goes almost 1.4 million. So um, I don't know if that says anything, but by Thursday, if uh, the market starts stalling out, it wouldn't be surprising that it could do a rollover to the downside if this volume is telling us that the volume's drying up. Anyway, but this uh, particular company, uh, short interest, 565%, so that's not huge, but it's a little bit decent. Uh, the moving averages are right in this neighborhood. You got the nine $19.50 day average and the 22 for 23 for the 200 day average. So it's kind of smack in the middle. And, um, you know, like George was saying, there's uh, 9 million stocks out there. If you don't have to trade this one, you might look elsewhere. Um, with regards to City Corp, now yeah, we're getting a little bigger. We're going to go from 2 billion to a whole bunch of more billion by going to Citigroup. Not much, and right? What is, what is Citigroup? Two and a half, three billion? <laughs> All right, so this is a company that everybody loved at uh, earlier. It went up towards 80, then it collapsed back down. Everyone telling me the price to uh, book is very attractive. And all I see is a company that seems to have a hard time getting above 70. But anyway, what do you see, George? Yeah, that, that's, I mean, that's a great way to, to lead into it. I, I think that Citigroup, like it's no secret that banks um, don't have very much uh, operational risk. They know that they're going to be bailed out if things go wrong. Um, and and being in the in the banking sector, their their exposure is a lot to the interest rate cycle. And the Federal Reserve starting to slow down their rate hike. Acts. I mean, Jerome Powell literally 180. He did a U turn. He was driving down Hawk Lane and then just turned around for some reason, decided to go back. I mean, we know that reason. That reason is Donald Trump. Um, you know, there there was a lot of pressure on him there and the stock market. So. This is this is a company that, as the interest rate increases, st tend to slow down. the The margins get squeezed, and that interest margin, the NIMS on banking stocks are are lowered, um, and it's feeling some of that pressure. And as a company that's really in the financial sector, it's at the forefront of everybody's screen. Everybody's looking on it, and it has the highest correlation to the overall market structure. So this is a company that. Look, a company like Shopify, uh, a company like BPMC, anyone, the Zuo, Zuora, those companies could do okay in downside environments of the broader market, but Citigroup is tied to the hip with the broad market. And so this is really not just a Citigroup play, it's a market play. Um, and remember one of the stocks we talked about, we're at a key structure right now where we've squeezed out a lot of the shorts from this last down run. 
The question is, can we find some new buyers to keep going out to new highs? And this is going to vary on a lot of things. It's going to vary on the China-US trade deal coming up. Uh, it's going to vary a lot of what happens on Brexit with the parliamentary vote. It's, it's based on the global economy. So this is a global play. So to answer the question of this stock in particular, um, I see that 66 is a really hard level to, to break above. It's riding that 100-day moving average right now. Momentum's turned back to the downside. This rally had absolutely no love. We were going up on decreasing volume. And so, and we've hit a, a resistance overhead, which has kind of been um, a, a hard place to get above. So I'm looking at this as actually a potential, an early potential to try the downside one more time because everybody forgot about the Christmas Eve lows. Steve Mnuchin goes in, says, I'm going to talk to the banks, reassure them everything is okay. Donald Trump tweets, it's a great time to buy stocks. And that was the low. And we've gone up. And now I think we're kind of cresting into an area where uh, there's, we've gone from everything's too risky and oversold to there's absolutely no risk. We're not pricing in the risk anymore to overbought very quickly. So I think the next move on City will be to the downside, as it will be with the whole market. Uh, sell anywhere between 63.50 to 64.50 area. And above 65, you got to throw in the towel and say, hey, I'm wrong. Being wrong is part of this business. And then look for the long trade. But this is a market play here more than, than any of the stocks so far. Yeah, the way I'm seeing Citigroup is that it's an international company more so than other banks. And their exposure internationally, I think, could be greater than other banks. And that might be one of the reasons why they've gotten thrown out with the baby in the bathwater. Because uh, Germany, if it is slowing down, their bank, Deutsche Bank, has been just a real dog. And now they're supposed to uh, combine possibly with Commerce Bank, which is another dog. And two dogs don't make a uh, thoroughbred. So anyway, uh, it's a situation here where uh, you borrow, you um, you pay out short, and you uh, and you loan out long. And uh, my feeling is is that uh, people who have just thrown the there's going to be no inflation and there's going to be no more uh, hiking or any Fed balance sheet. I think they've gotten extremely uh, over optimistic because I think uh, when you tear back the uh, the onion, you're going to see that what Mr. Powell said is we've hiked it up to two two and a quarter, which is the bottom of neutral, and we're going to take a pause because the stock market's collapsed. Then we're going to see what the data says. Well, my feeling is is that if you ever going to raise prices as a company, you'd probably do it when unemployment's at three and a half to four, and you'd probably do it when the stock market is going pretty well and people seem to be all working and having money so that when you raise prices, there's people there who can actually buy something. So I think the risk that prices may go up in the first quarter here greater than anticipated is more than 50-50. And if that happens, it's going to affect the bond market. And if it happens, it's going to ha affect the banks. So again, uh, something that uh, went up towards 80, then it went back up towards 75, that now it's going back up towards 65 or 70, you know, uh, is in a overall downward trend. And so uh, I have not been a believer in the banks. And thank God I didn't bite into them in the beginning of January of 2018 when they were being touted as the best place to be because it's been absolutely the worst place to be. And until um, I see some kind Kind of a spread on the yield for these banks to make money and maybe um, uh, some stabilization in the uh, international picture for Citigroup, uh, I'd be a little cautious on this company right now. So that's basically what I'm seeing. Again, it does look on a value basis, it looks like a pretty good deal. But if the environment's not great for them to make a lot of money, then it's going to be a tough racket. And that's the main thing. Again, like George was saying, you know, you can't be a, a stick in the mud here. You know, if the numbers start changing, you start going 65, you start going 70, a couple of months go by and it holds its water and the 50 day gets above the 200 day. You know, you can't stay with one viewpoint forever. Uh, if you stand still uh, long enough, you get run over. So you got to be flexible. But right now, it looks right now like it's having a big bear market rally. Um, next one on the loop here is RMD. What do you say, George, on RMD? Yeah, absolutely. Jim, I, I love one point you mentioned there about uh, when the party is at its best. It's like whenever the party is at its best and word gets out, that's a party I'm probably in the parking lot trying to leave. Um, and I think that's one of the the investor uh, flaws is that we tend to chase. So I love that you mentioned, you know, if, if conditions change, we could adjust our strategy, but let's not chase. Um, love it. So the next one is RMD. It's another one I've never really encountered. Uh, what I, Maybe I should explain a little bit very briefly. What I do is I have a list of stocks that are very high volume 
And because I trade mostly options rather than the stock itself, there needs to be a sufficient amount of volume in order for there to be an options market and a tight spread on the options market. I don't like to see a bid offer more than, you know, three, four cents, 10 cents maximum. Um, and so I don't even know if this company is optionable. So it, it hasn't made my watch list at any point. And looking at it, I don't know what happened, but going from 118 down to 90, <laughs> half the value gone literally in one earnings report, uh, that's just an alarm bell for me. I, to be perfectly honest with you, it makes me just want to go to the next one and not say anything else. Um, <laughs> Cause it's just, it, it's scary to me to see that, to, to have that amount of volatility means that whatever their business and operational model is, it, it just exposes you to a ton of volatility. And obviously it's a medical company. Jim was saying earlier, he had a brilliant point that they're, they're kind of, what's the next best thing you're going to innovate. That's what everybody's waiting for. And I, Love to celebrate a success if it's a great next thing, but I don't want to be part of it while they're trying to find the next best thing. And I guess the, the point I'm going to make is, um, you know, I'll see that company later. And when there's more value to it and they're they're getting more of a solid business model, more volume, I, I'll be on board. Uh, right now, this this massive gap down scares me. The, just the fact that it's done that would just put me off. Um, but I mean, in, hey, you look at this, you could say, hey, George, this is 50% cheaper than it was literally days ago. Maybe I should buy. And my counterpoint to that would be is, price is what you pay, value is what you get. Remember, the market's an instrument, the price of stocks. So if it's cheaper, look for the reason that it's cheaper and ask your question, uh, is this what it's worth? Because value is what the price is at at the moment. So I'm a little nervous about the stock, to be perfectly honest with you. Uh, I wouldn't even dig into the technicals. That's just my opinion. Yeah. Again, uh, this is not a company I'm familiar with, but looking at the numbers as I can see them, uh, it ran up pretty good from around the 70 level up to 120. That's a very big run up. And then it had a pullback uh, down uh, towards 100 and then another big run up, just a little bit of a new high, which we've seen before, where a, a market makes just a little bit of a new high and then it tanks. In fact, we saw the S&P do that, right? So the bottom line is, is that uh, it is a situation here where it was about 15 to 20 percent above its moving average when it hit the 120 area and that is in an overbought condition area i'm sure the uh, the calls were probably pretty fat so again a sell out of the money call and buy a put to protect your equity would have worked out very well here and this move down to 90 would have been not nearly as damaging to you uh right now again uh, we're uh, we went down to 90 which uh, made it a little bit oversold on the downside because the 200 days at 106 but there is a lot of news on this company and without knowing what that news is, you have to be very careful. Right now, it looks like 90 is a line in the sand on the downside, and it looks like uh, 106, 108 could be the lines in the sand on the upside because that's where the 50 and the 200 day uh, come into play. So it wouldn't surprise me if it stayed in a trading range now between 110 and 90 as it tries to sort out what this news is that clobbered the stock and see if the news is temporary or a more permanent problem. So right now, again, it may be trying to just. Uh, uh, stabilize as it uh, digests whatever news uh, made it whack to go down to 90. Okay, uh, let's go. And it's not a tiny company, by the way. It's 13, almost $14 billion market cap. So it's certainly not a mom and pop operation. But again, um, it has had some news hit it to cause a very big order imbalance where the sellers were outweighing the buyers by a lot. And whoever's on the other side of the trade said, I'll drop the bid to 90 and then you can sell all you want. Which happens yeah. a lot. Which happens a lot. It's pretty um, scary, though. So it's, you mentioned it's a hundred. How much was the market cap, Jim? What'd you mention there? Uh, third, uh, almost fourteen billion. So we lost seven billion dollars of market capital overnight. That wow. Yeah. Yeah. That's well. Oof. That that's the uh, medical <laughs> and the biotech area. You know, yeah. when, when the news hits, you don't want to be on the wrong side of it. That's for sure. For sure. Uh, that's why sometimes, you know, having an option strategy to defend your position, uh, yes, uh, the insurance can eat away at your principal and that. But uh, when it does hit, uh, having some insurance on there certainly is not a bad place to be. I was going to mention that with an option, uh, I think a lot of the viewers, if you're not familiar with option strategy, if the opportunity here is that you look at these stocks and you say, if it drops a dollar, I'm going to put my stop loss there. The problem is that nobody's willing to buy it. And when it gaps, doesn't matter where your stop is, you're selling it at the market at the next day's open. So there's a lot of gap risk. When you're putting uh, s capital into a smaller company like this, that I mean, it's not small, but it's very volatile in this in this space. You got to understand that there's more risk of the entire capital you're putting in the position 
whereas an option just expires whatever you put into it. So there's, this is a, if it's an optionable stock, I'd be trading that with options 100%. Well, the next one here is going to be a momentum play again because it's really been taking off here since January. And uh, today it had a very good day and the volume was quite strong. So well, let's take a look at Canada Goose Holdings and uh, get an idea of what George thinks on that. Awesome. Canada Goose. So I'm from Canada, actually. I'm, we're located in Toronto Trade Pro Academy headquarters. So, you know, the, the George Goose. <laughs> uh, so I'm from Canada and, and I see these. Look, Canada Goose is not a jacket or apparel company. Canada Goose is a trend and a fashionable company. You look at the real jackets they started with, the Expeditions, that's that's what they're called. Nobody wears the Expedition, but that's where they started. Uh, either Expedition or the Explorer, it's a really massive, heavy-duty rig. Uh, and days like today, right now, Jim, it's it's crazy. It's snow and ice and rain falling down at the same time. And so- Good day, good day to have a goose uh, coat on? Yeah, <laughs> I did not. I had the North Face. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I was uh, shopping for a new jacket around Christmas, and the lineup at Canada Goose was astronomical. So there's still demand for it, but I think it's a it's more of a fashion play um, at this point, and the value shows that. If you look at this company, it's rallied quite a bit in the, the start of this year, 2019. Earnings are due on February 14th on Valentine's Day. So I don't know if they're going to serve a love affair or if it's going to be a bust, but I will say this, 62 half to 65 looks like the top of this move. So we're a little late on this rally, uh, and I don't want to pay a high price to get into momentum when it's trading at its highest. We are above the moving averages. The 100 still pointing down. The 200 starting to point up. So it's starting to get a little bit of momentum. It's right in front of earnings, so I would kind of wait this one out. But a level that I would get excited about a can the goose. Uh, the first one and the more aggressive is around 54.72 because there's a gap structure there, and as well there's some naked points of control that just got traded through. And below there, around the $50 marker would be really exciting. Um, I love the product. They make some really heavy-duty jackets. And I think that, you know, fashion and the the um, the fact of wearing a can, the goose, just for the brand itself is a lot of the value uh, of this company. And nothing's wrong with that. A lot of successful brands do well. I just um, I see it as, as an opportunity to head higher if we pull back. But I could see this company going through some volatility in the next couple of years. It's a very competitive space. Okay. Well, the way I'm seeing it here is obviously it's uh, jumped above these moving averages, which is a positive. And uh, the volume today was very strong on an up day. That's another positive. Uh, some of the things that would make me a little bit concerned is that the PE ratios on it is 83, uh, which means you're paying a very good amount of money for a dollar of earnings. And that makes it a little bit of a dice roll. And uh, the other good thing is the short interest is 13% of the stock. So I'm sure some of these people who were short when it dropped from 70 area down to 40, you know, has uh, covered those shorts and that's causing a little bit of this thing as well. Uh, if we got to 63, 64, you'd be 20% above the 200 day average. And that would be a neighborhood where I think it might look a little stretched unless these earnings are going to blow people out of the water, which at 83 to one PE ratio, you would imagine they're going to be because if they don't with that kind of over, uh, with that kind of high valuation, you know, this thing would be very vulnerable to a reversal. I'm sure they came out with some sobering news when it went from 70 down towards 40. So, uh, again, the rebound rally here takes you up towards uh, 60, maybe 63. And then uh, if the news sobers up with earnings, again, the pullback might occur at that point. Hey, let's uh, get a few more here quick before we close up. Uh, Dunkin' Donuts, D-N-K-N. Is that Dunkin' Donuts? It is, yeah, Dunkin' Donuts. I uh, I was like, where, who, who eats or drinks Dunkin' Donuts coffee? And I'm a Canadian, remember. And I went to the U.S. and I found out they're everywhere. Uh, we don't yeah, have too many in Canada. <laughs> so... Uh, Dunkin you got a Horton up there. You got Horton up there all the time, right? Yeah, yeah. Tim Hortons, exactly. Yeah, Timmy Tim Horton. Yeah. And it's so darn cold. <laughs> the coffee freezes on your walk to the office. So, um, <laughs> so for Dunkin' Donuts, I think that they're in a space that isn't. It's losing its, its attractiveness and appeal. I mean, the coffee sector is always good, but when you look at the the sugary treats and snacks, there's kind of a whole wave of, and it starts with the millennial generation and up, where it's more health conscious. And, you know, for that reason, I'm a little nervous around it. But as a trade opportunity, I also see a short opportunity on it. On Dunkin' Donuts, you could see that volume has uh, started to kind of increase to the downside. We're below the moving averages, below the 70 key marker. And I think right. that sell opportunities are 69 to 69 and a half. Get back in, try to get it down to the 60. And that's a great trade. 
Okay. Um, Duncan definitely looks like it hit resistance at 70. It's now uh, coming down. The volume today was very large compared to what it's been. So it looks like a company that's going to try to roll over and maybe go back down, either test the low or even take it out. Uh, we'll have to see, but it definitely does look like it's rolling over. Uh, we've got a couple minutes. Let's just take a real quick uh, word on these things. So just a real quick uh, reaction to Twitter. Not possible. I drink a lot of coffee. I talk a lot, Jim. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> Twitter, um, Twitter, a... I don't know how this company is still around. I mean, Twitter is a great company for uh, trading, et cetera, and, and news. It's become kind of – its niche has become the news. Twitter is range-bound, uh, very gappy stock. There's a lot of things that move it. I'd probably be a hold pattern on this one. I'm not really – there's it's just a whole bunch of chaos from technicals, price action, and business model standpoint. There's a lot of turmoil. Unless you're a long-term investor that, that thinks Twitter is going to be around for the next decade, two decades, um, I, I would pass on Twitter for trades. I think there's better opportunities. Yeah. And if it takes out, uh, my only addition would be if it takes out the uh, low of uh, January there, uh, it might have a more significant drop. Let's go to the next one real quick so we can close this thing out. Uh, EXPE. Yeah, absolutely. Expedia. Um, very gappy stock as well. I'm seeing technical starting to move up a little bit. This is a really interesting sell off here because the last two days of selling after earnings came in on low volume. Uh, so it could actually be a decent pickup on Expedia. One second, EXPE. I got to change the screen, and um, maybe around the 123 half area. There's a lot of support structure there. Uh, could be a good shot long, but momentum starting to increase to the upside, and this downside with low volume is actually pretty optimistic. Okay, and uh, your last opinion on PayPal? Uh, I love PayPal. We uh, we use PayPal quite a bit. Uh, it's a great company. They're they're really captured a lot of the market sector or the market space of payments and uh, as a result you could see they're they're riding the train up and they're they're almost on highs so i think paypal is a good buy opportunity um at this point momentum starting to move up but it's not overbought yet we're cresting here on a breakout i think if we get back into the chop the middle of this consolidation structure at 91 uh, 15 to 89 93 a uh, good long level there for calls or just straight up into the stock yeah it looks like people who are already into um uh, MasterCard and Visa, you know, are using this as another diversification to try to cover most of the whole space there. So I think that's probably not the worst idea in the world to be diversified between all three of them. Absolutely. But, um, okay. Well, we had a good time here today and we went over a lot of information. I did want to uh, let everybody know that Neil uh, Batho is uh, traderreview.net. He had technical difficulties, but if you'd like to know more about uh, what he's into, uh, that's his uh, traderreview.net. Uh, and uh, that's Neil Batho. Uh, George, just wrap up uh, again who you are and how people can contact you and uh, and then uh, take it from there. Yeah, absolutely, Jim. Uh, thanks for having us on here, by the way. We're, we're really happy to be part of this. Um, our our company is tradeproacademy.com. We offer some swing trading services by means of um, newsletters as well, really in-depth courses on options and overall structuring trade opportunities. Um, and then we also have on the more active side, day trading using futures, using more advanced order flow uh, techniques, inventory, and, and it's a little more complex, but it's more cash flow trading for the short term. And then you could diversify that with swing trading for the long term. So people say, should I be a swing trader, day trader? You could be both. Um, we're at Trade Pro Academy. Every morning at 9 a.m., we go on YouTube and do a morning market update. Um, we talk about a lot of the news events, what could move markets, throw out some levels as well, and have really good open discussion. Uh, our YouTube sure. channel is tradeproacademy uh, youtube.com forward slash tradeproacademy. Academy. You'll find us on there and our website is tradeproacademy.com. We have a six lesson free course that you guys could check out if you go on the site and hit the free training button at the very top. Great. Okay, George, thanks a lot for being here. Real quick, we're running late, so I'll just get to the point. Um, optionprofessor.com has a weekly update on all the different markets, be it the stock market, the bond market, the dollar, gold, oil, and it's every Friday. So you simply go to optionprofessor.com. You'll get the link. You, you hit on the link, and then you can go to the uh, webinar, or you can also go on YouTube and look at uh, archived copies. Also, if you have any questions on the options, using them as a hedge, limited rest speculation or anything like that, I'd be more than happy to give you a hand. You just shoot me an email at optionprofessor at gmail.com and I'll be more than happy to see what I can do to help. Uh, for David Cosmitter, I'm just going to throw it back to him. And uh, again, it was good talking to everybody and good luck in all your trading. Awesome. Thanks, Jim. It was fun uh, going rapid fire with you. Nice to meet you. Thanks, and uh, Good stuff.
Okay. All right. Uh, thanks, guys. Uh, great timing and good discussion. Got through the whole list tonight, so that's always good. Uh, just a reminder for everyone watching, be sure to subscribe to Timing Research on YouTube and your favorite podcast network. Uh, you can also go to timingresearch.com to get access to the archive for this show or, or any of the past shows. Um, let's see, for next week, uh, the uh, Crowd Forecast News, the Monday show, will be off because of the market holiday, but I, I will still be publishing the report, as usual, on Sunday night. And, uh, and then the next episode of this show, uh, episode number 66, will be back on next Tuesday night, the 19th, um, at 4.30 p.m. Eastern Time. So uh, be sure to join us for that. And I uh, just want to thank my guests for this week, George Papazov of Trade Pro Academy and Jim Kenny of OptionProfessor.com. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, David. Thank you, David.